Welcome back, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with the next panel. Um, working for XPRIZE for over, uh, about a year now, I understand the power of prizes, and so I'm really excited about this panel. So I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, who is the Chief Systems Engineer at NASA Space Portal, Bruce Pittman. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Isn't feedback a wonderful thing? Um, see, I just woke you all up, though, didn't I? So anyway, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I have an outstanding panel um, for you today. And we're going to talk about a really interesting topic, and that's prizes. Now, who doesn't like prizes? I mean, remember when you were a kid, for those of you that are old enough to remember this, with, with Cracker Jacks, and you always wanted to know or those stupid cereal things where you were always trying to get to the bottom of the box so you could get the little, the little prize. So, so we all grew up um, liking prizes. So this is kind of like prizes on steroids. So, you know, some really good, some really good stuff. So um, let me have some opening remarks and to kind of set the stage here and uh, put a little historical perspective on this. And I'm going to turn it over and introduce the, the panelists, and then they'll each make some introductory remarks. Then we'll do some... Uh, discussions here and then we'll open it up to, to uh, discussions and questions from the, uh, from the audience. So as was mentioned, this is the 45th anniversary of Apollo 11. As a matter of fact, 45 years ago today, Apollo 11 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and the mission was over and you got them to see them in the little, uh, their, their little isolation suits and then they went in the little trailer, the isolation trailer, because we were afraid that they were going to have moon bugs. And, and that whole thing. And we did a science conference this, this, um, this week at Ames, and I was chairing a, a, a focus group on lunar commerce. And so what I started to do is I started saying, you know, it's been 45 years since, uh, since Apollo, and a, a certain number of things have happened. I said, what did the world look like 45 years before Apollo? You know, so I started, you know, what did I do? I did what everybody does. I went to Google, and I said, you know, history, U.S., 1924. And what came up? Guess who's president of the United States? Your good friend and mine, Calvin Coolidge, you know, is president of the United States. There's this new radical music on, in New York called Rhapsody in Blue by this guy named Gershwin, you know, who isn't known for this kind of stuff, but, and, Gershwin was scared to death that this thing was absolutely going to bomb, but it did okay. Montana elected the first woman governor in 1924, and two people you've never probably heard of, a guy named Jimmy Carter and George Herbert Walker Bush, were both born in 1924. So it was kind of an interesting year. And it was also the last year of the original Ortigue Prize. So Ortigue was a rich um, hotelier in uh, New York City. And in 1919, he had established a prize with the Aero Club of America for a $25,000 prize for the first uh, entity, you know, non-governmental entity, to fly from either New York to Paris or Paris to New York, whichever way you wanted to go. And if you did that successfully, you would get $25,000. So he established that in 1919, and it timed out in 1924 because it was only good for five years. And guess what? Nobody won. So rule number one about prizes. One is you don't have to pay unless somebody wins. And two, that if you don't set it right or if you are too aggressive or, or the conditions aren't right, sometimes nobody goes after it. Ortigue does not give up, though. He redid the prize for another uh, period of time. So again, this is 1924. Um, and he did something in else on the second go round. He actually put the money in the bank in a trust fund. 
So it's like, you know, are you, do you really got the money? You know, so he actually put the money in the bank and there was a, there was a panel, you know, that w of judges there and all that. And so that started, uh, so now aviation had progressed to the point where there was a lot of, a lack, a lot of activity about it. And this, you know, guy that nobody had ever heard of before, a guy named Charles Lindbergh, you know, nobody was betting on Lindbergh. And he went and he won this thing and became an overnight sensation. I mean, he was the rock star of, of aviation um, to that, to, at that point in time. So the idea here is, is that prizes can be a powerful tool. And so if, if you look at that, um, also in 1924, the other thing I found out was that the first around the world flight occurred by uh, some Army Air Corps um, float planes and they flew around the world successfully and they survived and they lived. It took them 175 days to fly around the world. 45 years later after that first 175 day flight, the Boeing 747 first flew, 1969, same year as the Apollo astronauts walked on the moon. So the reason that I bring this up is that the past does not have to equal the future, that change is often comes in fits and starts, and I would say that we've been in a fit and maybe we're starting to see a start, or maybe it's the other way around. I can never get my fits and my starts, you know, straight. But, you know, the, the, the future can be different and sometimes it moves at lightning fast speed. Remember, it was only 20 years ago that people were sitting in rooms like this because this hotel was here then, and they were saying, have you heard of this thing called the internet? Do you ever think anybody's gonna make any money at that? 20 years ago, people were having that discussion, and now we know the answer to that is, yeah, a lot of money. So I think the same thing is true of space. So we have assembled an outstanding panel of folks here to help us um, address this. And I'm gonna start on the far end there. Uh, Jen Gestetic is the program executive at NASA headquarters on the, uh, in the office of the chief technologist responsible for uh, prizes and challenges. And so she's gonna talk to us about a thing called the Centennial Challenges that, that NASA um, has undertaken and some of the, the weird and wonderful things that, that has been accomplished there and some of the, uh, the surprising stories that have come out of that. Next to her is Joel Carnes. Uh, he is the VP of Operations for the XPRIZE Foundation. And he's not a space guy, but he knows a lot about prizes and promotions and stuff like that. And then on the user side, on the recipient side, um, we have the CEO of Mastin Space Systems, uh, Sean Mahoney, is the, uh, the CEO. And he's going to talk to us about the impact and the, 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 the challenges of, of winning the uh, Lunar Lander Challenge and that whole horse race and things like that. And if you weren't wa paying attention back then, it was really a fascinating kind of a David and Goliath story. And you know, um, and then his boss, you know, Dave Mastin is, is on the cover of Aviation Week. So he's our rock star, he's around here somewhere. Um, so you can, you know, if you can dig up the magazine, I'm sure he'll sign it for you. Um, but anyway, I, I was so blown away when I saw, when I saw Dave's uh, picture on the, on the cover of Aviation Week. I mean, that's, for, a, for a space person, that's like the cover of the Rolling Stone, you know. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Art Dula. I think there's probably nobody around here that doesn't know Art, but he's here uh, representing the Heinlein Trust. He is a tr trustee of the Heinlein Trust. Uh, a man who was near and dear to my heart because he's the, you know, Heinlein was the guy that got me inspired to get into this crazy business. Uh, and I actually had the, the fortune to, uh, to meet him in the, in the early 1980s. And so um, Art is helping to, to um, continue that legacy that Heinlein um, started and with his fiction and now we're trying to turn that into facts. So I think that's the kind of the amazing kind of story here is that science fiction is now turning into reality before our eyes and the good news is now we can participate. So I think I'm gonna go in the order that I introduced him and then just to add a little bit of excitement, um, Art has, a, has a, um, an announcement that he's gonna make during his comments. But Jen, we're gonna start off with you. So. Um, I have some slides, like the NASA person <laughs> on the couch, if y'all can pull up my slides. Thank you. I just had to do it, guys. It's also some great pictures to share with you here. So 
I am um, the Prizes and Challenges Program Executive in the Office of the Chief Technologist. It's a new job. It was created two and a half years ago um, to coordinate the agency's use of prizes, challenges, and crowdsourcing at the agency. Before that, we had done a lot of, since 2005, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, we've been doing large technology development and demonstration prize competitions through the Centennial Challenges Program. Um, and we've been experimenting with other forms of prizes and competitions using crowdsourcing and online platforms with folks like Inincentive and Topcoder since about 2008. And so these pockets of innovation, these pockets of programs that are using these incentivized innovation principles had been um, happening at NASA for about a decade and the agency decided they needed to um, have a coordinator um, uh, for those activities and someone to put together um, a strategy for how these uh, tools are used in general at the agency and drive their use more. So a few other federal agencies actually have this role now. USAID has a role like that. HHS has a role like that. So it's something that's starting to grow within the federal government in general as well. It's not just something NASA has done, finding kind of a point for prizes and challenges within the agency. Um, and the White House recognizes that what NASA has done has been um, really demonstrating a leadership role in um, using these kinds of tools um, for the federal government. Next slide. So we use prizes, challenges, and crowdsourcing in a number of different ways. Um, and it's not just for big technology development and demonstration prizes. So the types of prizes where you build hardware and you bring it to an event and then you demonstrate it head to head, the type of challenge that um, uh, my Mastin colleague will talk about a little bit later, um, those ones usually have big dollar values associated with them and um, they uh, are hardware challenges. It's about the technology. There's also other types of solutions though that NASA can seek through crowdsourcing and prizes. Those solutions can look like software, algorithms, ideas, business plans, a lot of different types of solutions that don't necessarily require a physical prototype and hardware um, to be uh, uh, evaluated and um, demonstrated head to head. And so you see a number of different types of solutions um, that we get through using uh, crowdsourcing activities. Next slide. Um, there's also a bunch of different benefits um, to using this approach. Um, Bruce mentioned a few of them, paying only for results, a number of others, and I'll go through some examples. I won't go through this whole list, but I'll go through some examples later that um, really show uh, how NASA is finding these benefits through our use of these different, um, of these tools. But um, an important point is that prizes are not the right tool for every problem, but they can be transformative for the right kind of problem. So I would be the last person to say just make any problem that you face a prize, because you're not necessarily going to incentivize the right solvers or um, even the right solutions through a prize competition. Sometimes contracts and grants are the way to go, depending on where the solvers are and depending on um, what you know about the solution space that you're looking for and how strict your requirements are around what that solution needs to look like. Next slide. Um, so another thing to, to um, make it more relevant, just how much of a kind of big deal these tools are for government. Since 2010, $64 million, $64 million worth of um, prize purse has been available through challenge.gov on over 300 federal challenges from a number of different federal agencies. And so um, it's not just $50 in a t-shirt type of top coder challenges uh, or app contests where you come and get pizza um, that, uh, that are happening. Those are certainly happening, but those aren't the only type. I mean, there's the largest prize purse that you'll see up there. I think the max was 10 million. I can't read, 10, 15 maybe. It's, um, but the, they range significantly from zero dollars up to double digit million dollar um, prize purses. But they're happening all over the federal government. So this isn't just um, a trend that um, is in the, the, the sidelines. It's actually a trend that's transforming the way government does business in a lot of ways. Next slide. Three really quick examples. So this um, is the International Space Station, for those of you that didn't know. Um, we have uh, uh, an issue where the laundrons, which are the metal, uh, the metal rods that hold up the solar panels, um, as they get shaded, uh, they'll contract or they'll expand um, as they cool and they heat up, and that's bad for the, the uh, solar panels because it can cause fatigue, cracking, all sorts of nasty things that you don't want to deal with for energy, um, energy creation. And so one of the things that um, uh, the NASA Tournament Lab, which is run by Jason Cruzan, um, who will be speaking tomorrow, um, that, uh, that group was looking at if there was a way to develop a better model to understand how you could position the laundrons 
in the toughest orbital positions to maximize the amount of energy um, draw while minimizing shadowing on the Langeron. It's a math problem. But it's a math problem that had largely been um, uh, something that we'd gone to the same model for years and years and years to, um, to answer that question for us when we were in tough orbital positions. We thought maybe coders out on the top coder platform might be able to come up with a better way um, for us to solve that math problem. And so for $45,000 in prizes, 45K, $45,000, not a lot of money. Um, and in three weeks, three weeks, this top coder community of over 4,000 solvers that got involved um, came up with a solution that was as good as the current implementation um, for the International Space Station, which had been developed by aerospace experts. And these are coders from around the globe that have no aerospace expertise that developed a model in three weeks for $45,000 that was just as good as the current model. Next slide. Uh, pay only for results. This is, uh, uh, we, ha we have a challenge with measuring strain on Kevlar and Vectran webbing, um, webbed materials. It's evidently really difficult to measure uh, uh, strain accurately in the lab on that particular material. So we did a $20,000 inocentive challenge, $20,000, um, and got three solutions, uh, basically the same solution, from folks that, um, that gave us a, a different method to measure this strain in the lab. And es essentially it was about um, the solution that won was about attaching a, a, rubber, um, a rubber strip to the same jig that you were pulling on the other material with and taking the measurement from the rubber instead of the, um, the webbed material. And the engineers that actually had, um, had gotten this solution in said they, they had an, I could have had a V8 moment. We're like, I can't believe that we didn't see that. We'd been struggling with this problem for months and for $20,000, which is a fraction of a WIE or an FTE, fraction, um, they were able to get a solution that was immediately testable in the lab. Next slide. And this is my last example. So this one um, I'll only touch on quickly because my colleague from Aston will probably talk about this one in much more detail. This is the Lunar Lander X challenge that actually it's interesting who's on the couch right now because NASA put up the $2 million purse for that particular challenge. X Prize was our allied organization that conducted the challenge in 2008 and 2009 and Maston was the winner of the challenge. Uh, so we've got this whole challenge represented on the couch right now. But one of the things that I find really interesting about this, this prize competition, which was a big technology development and demonstration prize. So people, they built those things and brought them to a demonstration event on their own dime. We didn't give them any seed capital. We didn't give them any money in advance. They built those things competing for $2 million if they were able to do what NASA challenged them to do. And they were. So they walked away with a, a big check at the end. Mastin, I think, walked away with a total of 1.15 million, and Armadillo walked away with a total of 750K at the end of that prize competition. But what I find so interesting about um, uh, this activity as well is that um, you guys will be hearing tomorrow about the Lunar Catalyst Partnership. Um, there will be a panel on that, and Jason Cruzan is going to be talking a little bit more about public private partnerships in um, space exploration. And the three companies that were awarded space act agreements with NASA to develop lunar lander capabilities for the future are all three companies that coalesced around prizes. This is huge. Maston Space Systems, um, Astrobiotic, and um, Moon Express. That's huge. Three people that are now in capability development COTS likes partnerships with NASA are prize teams. All of them, 100%. You'll hear more about that tomorrow. Uh, next slide. Bottom line, these are some of my, my personal lessons learned. Just go ahead and click through these. Um, and we can talk more about these later if you guys have any questions, stop there. Um, prizes are really transforming the way that we're doing business and government. It's not a, um, uh, they're not just fun and games. It's not just for apps contests and it's not just for ways to give away t-shirts and Cracker Jack boxes. They're really ways to solve real problems and engage expertise and excess time from people around the globe that want to be involved in their space program in ways that we haven't had these tools in the past. So it's really transforming the ways in which we can, uh, we can combine the contributions from novices and non-experts in this field to the work of experts to maximize the outcomes that we're getting. Um, also, uh, you'll, you're not going to read through all of these, one, these, but the last one I'll say is if you've seen one prize, you've seen one prize. They all look very different. And so there's a whole league of people that are emerging as prize designers and incentivized kind of innovation design um, folks um, 
uh, in a variety of different fields that are working on the ways to structure problems this way because it's not trivial, um, the problem definition process. Uh, engineers are taught to, you know, I'm trained engineer as well, aerospace, go Gators. Um, I'm tra you're trained to, with what you know, what you're trying to find, and all the solution, uh, and all of the equations that you need to optimize the pathway to solve that problem. You're not trained necessarily in the problem definition process. And so when you ask an engineer, no, 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 just tell me what A is and what B is and not how to get from A to B, they go, no, 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 I want to solve it. Don't make me do that. I want to solve it. I want to solve the problem. I don't want to define the problem. And so it's really trying to flip the way that we think about problems and the way that we think about defining requirements and not over, um, uh, over um, constraining a solution by putting too many requirements on it. Enable to, uh, in order to enable innovation. It's a new way of thinking. So this is just the beginning. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague from XPRIZE. Joel. Thank you, Jen. Um, to piggyback on what you said, XPRIZE is actually in the problem definition business. Right? That, that is what we do, is we identify grand challenges out in the world, pull together sponsors to, to get a, enough of a purse and operations budget together, and then lay it out there and say, come on, everybody, let's solve this thing. We were inspired from the very beginning by the Ortigue Prize that Bruce mentioned. Uh, what he didn't mention when he was describing how the art and science of prizes is putting the balance between audacious and achievable, getting something that people will go for but is, has meaning when they achieve it. You knew this was the case with Ortigue, it was certainly audacious. Six people died trying to win that prize in three separate crashes. So this was, this was something that the best pilots of their day gave their lives trying to, trying to do. They were flying planes that cost $100,000 or more trying to win a $25,000 prize. So that's, that's why it was so miraculous when Lindbergh won. People today go, okay, big deal. He flew from New York to Paris. He overcame obstacles that the brightest minds with all the money, all the backing in the world couldn't do, and that demonstrated the power of prizes. You may be familiar with the movie The Spirit of St. Louis. There's a, a book by the same title, and that was Lindbergh's plane. Peter Diamandis, our founder, read that book back in the 80s, and he was inspired by the prize concept. Wow, this is really amazing. You can can put this purse out there and people from around the world who you don't even know who they are will come up with solutions. You don't know what the solution is. You're just saying what the problem is and people will spend exponential amounts of money over the prize purse to solve the problem for you. And being a space guy, he had a space problem. He wanted to get to space. And he came up with the Ansari X Prize, $10 million for the first team that could fly 100 miles into space come back to Earth and do it again within two weeks. The balance between audacious and achievable was a problem here because it turned out that 100 miles into space was a little too deep. So we needed to back the truck up and go 100 kilometers into space, which for American audiences made no difference anyway because <laughs> they didn't know, know what we were talking about. But it's, there's a, an art to this in that you have to be aware of, of, the, of the challenges that the teams are going through what you're actually trying to achieve and put those two things together as you're running your prizes, as you're defining your prizes. Because we weren't trying to achieve a ship that can go up to space and come back. We we're trying to achieve Virgin Galactic, right? That was the end result that we were trying to get to. And we had teams from around the world spend a hundred million dollars trying to win the ten million dollar purse. And it was a, such a successful demonstration of the power of prizes that Peter, rather than s just doing a prize, which was actually the original intent, then started the XPRIZE Foundation. Since then, we've given away $25 million in, in prize purses. We have $50 million in purses actively going right now, including the $30 million Google Lunar X Prize, And we have a number of per prizes on the way. And I, I think that we can say that the, the publicity around the Ansari success has generated a lot of this kind of renaissance of prizes. There's, there's two things coming into confluence. Because we work at the very far end, in this grand challenge end. 
absolutely Ansari drove that. There's also this crowdfunding element, this communication element, and this kind of broad sense of, of collaboration that we haven't seen historically, and that also is leading to a renaissance in prizes. Put those two things together, and this tool is now something that is available to government, to classrooms, to millionaire philanthropists, you name it, you can find a place on the continuum to, to use it. And I will wrap up my opening comments by saying that our job at XPRIZE is, is A, to define these challenges, to, to convene people, to put a flag out on the hill and say, who's gonna be first to get to this flag? But also, the day-to-day -day grunt work of that is non-trivial, right? Uh, the GLXP's been going for a long, long time. These prizes are multi-year engagements. And one of the things that we do and that, that all people who are doing prize competitions need to do is support the teams, right? We need to create an ecosystem in which they can be successful. And maybe that means winning the prize. Maybe that means being a supplier to a team that wins the prize. Maybe that means acquiring a team that wins the prize. Because again, we're not just about the purse, we're about the effect that the prize has. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sean and say, what, what has the effect been? Good afternoon. I'm the effect of an X prize. <laughs> uh, I could tell you all kinds of great stories about the legend of Mastin competing, but I would tell those stories because I'm just retelling the stories that I heard because I wasn't part of the company. Uh, it was a different team uh, than the Mastin team today. Dave is still here. His name is still on the building, still on the shirt. But the rest of the team is actually there today because of that X Prize. Um, so uh, for those, if there's anyone, folks that are not familiar, Mastin was uh, very honored to have won the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge. Did I get that right? X I get Challenge. X Challenge. So can I the name is about this long, um, but uh, it was it was a great uh, it was a great event that gave the company something to really focus on and, and a way to kind of define ourselves. And if you ever stop by the shop, we actually have some pictures of what became flying components that you've maybe seen on the YouTube videos um, back when they were bolted down test stands. Um, so what I can I can provide some perspective on the benefit of prizes. But I can also tell you that a prize and a million dollars, a million dollars to the entrepreneur who's scraping by right now and is trying to figure out how they're going to make their project work, a million dollars sounds like a lot of money. To anyone who has managed to run a business, especially in space, a million dollars is nothing. So um, hopefully today we'll, we'll come up with a couple of interesting things for those of you who are competing or thinking about prizes as a basis for your business. Uh, it is a phenomenal thing, and it has been to Mastin's great benefit to be uh, a prize winner. Um, and then our job since then has been to take that prize winning team and turn it into a company. Boy, that's amazing. <laughs> Just amazing. And the most interesting thing is that NASA is starting to use prizes to leverage the investment of the half cent of each tax dollar that goes in to the space program to make things possible in the private sector. That's, uh, you'd be congratulated. Uh, thank you, I'm a late addition to the panel. My name's Art Dula, I'm a attorney from Houston, Texas, so forgive me if I don't understand much of the technology. But I'd like to ask, has anybody in this room read anything by Robert Heinlein? Just raise your hand if you've read a book by Robert Heinlein. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, in that case, we can close the doors and tell the truth. <laughs> uh, Mr. Heinlein wrote speculative fiction, and he's a great American writer. And I'm his literary executor, which means that when a contract comes in, now I, I sign it. Uh, uh, I, I sign my name. I don't sign Heinlein's, I'm not trying to channel him or anything. But after he died at the age of 80 in 1988, uh, Jenny Heinlein, Virginia Heinlein, decided to honor his memory by creating a prize trust that's like the, uh, the Nobel Prize Trust. 
And as a matter of fact, our trust runs according to uh, pretty much the rules of the Nobel Prize Trust. The Heinlein Prize is a prize for accomplishments by an individual or group of individuals in commercial space activities. And all of those words are important. It's for accomplishments. So uh, this let the first 10 people that came to me and said, Art, it's not enough money. I can't do my project if you give me the money. I, I can't do it. Uh, they didn't understand. Uh, it, it isn't uh, for things that haven't been done yet. It's for accomplishments that have already occurred to recognize people and to do exactly what you said, to, to give the luster of recognition to them. But the prize is a quarter of a million dollars, which for an aerospace prize for recognition for something like the Guggenheim Prize is pretty good. In other words, uh, we won't give you the money to build it, but we, we do have, and we've given it two times. The first time was to Peter, Peter Diamandis, essentially for being Peter Diamandis, uh, and, and for doing many things, but specifically for the Ansari X Prize. And in, in talking to Paul Allen, who is richer than God, and, and, and financed this out of pocket change, and in St. Louis got up and said how much publicity he got for no money, and slowly he realized the people in the audience really thought that $32 million probably was real money. But, you know, it's the fuel bill for a couple of his yachts. He said his first interest in space and s space science came from reading Rocket Ship Galileo. Of, uh, and he, he later repeated that in a newspaper article for the Seattle newspaper. And the first book, the first book on the International Space Station as part of the Science Fiction Library was put up there, and it's a Heinlein book. It's uh, uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And I can tell you a little secret. Last week we signed or agreed to, we haven't signed the contract yet, and, and keep this to yourselves, but uh, a major studio has taken an option in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress to make it into a movie. <laughs> now, let me tell you, that's not the announcement that I was going to make. I'll make it, but you didn't know about that, did you? And uh, I just hope they do it right, that they don't screw it up. You know, Starship Troopers, hey, great movie, but nothing to do with the book. Uh, the Heinlein Prize does other things, too, and let me talk to you about it for a minute, because our second prize was given to Elon Musk. And you say, well, that makes sense. He built a rocket and stuff like that. We gave it to him for the Falcon 1, not the Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 is a NASA program. Almost all of it is paid for by government contracts, and much of it by uh, 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 contracts that don't really have to be repaid. Some of it is for delivery contracts. But we don't give prizes for things on government contracts. We give prizes for things that are done by people who take risks with their own money. And Mr. Musk had about $100 million from his 10% share of PayPal that he, he sold to uh, uh, eBay. And he put about $90 million of it into building the first four Falcon 1s, one of which worked. And I suspect if that last one hadn't worked that mm, we might have seen a different result. But we think that was very much worth the Heinlein Prize, and we gave it to him on the day after his 40th birthday. He was headed for Europe. I think we paid for his birthday party. <laughs> he was chartering the Orient Express. Uh, at any rate, uh, we also give away a very, very cool sword. Uh, that is, we have a sword maker who makes a sword that is the sword from Glory Road, uh, the Lady of Aviemus, for those of you who read Heinlein. And we give away one of those swords to the Heinlein Prize winner. And there are videos of Elon Musk essentially chasing his secretary around the office with this sword. And it's a, if you go up on YouTube. And I suggested that Peter and Elon get together and maybe have a sword fight. It would be interesting. But I want to tell you what else we're doing in prizes because we're doing some other things. We can't find anybody to give the Heinlein Prize to that has an ac accomplished, an individual accomplished commercial space activities. There's a lot of them that are in the pressure cooker right now that are going to be prizes in the future. 
And I should mention we're an international prize. We operate all over the world. And we specifically set up a prize contest in Asia and in Europe that's an international contest for students and young engineers. The prize is small. It's only a few thousand dollars. But teams of people come to compete. We can't do it in the United States because of the ITAR laws. We, 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 can't, we have to have international judges, and you can't give aerospace information to international people without a license in the United States. Uh, and, and it would be very difficult to, to do it. So uh, Elon and SpaceX and Gwen Shotwell were kind enough to give us uh, experiment space on a Dragon Lab. They donated it to the trust, and we held a contest just in the United States for researchers to use that Dragon Lab flight. And we had 20 or 30 <coughs> organizations compete, and it was won by a the University of Texas medical system, who had never done anything in space before. And that's another good thing about prizes, that people will be attracted to them from outside of the area of people that normally come into things. And that Dragon Lab flight's going to occur eventually. But I want to tell you about what we do outside the United States. In Europe and in Asia, and we divide the whole world between Europe and Asia, there are two contests called Flight to the Future contests. And they're for young people under 30 years old. They can be engineers, they can be students, they can be anybody. Up to three people can be on a team. And the first time we did it in Europe, we got about 40 teams. And we held a, a nice dinner, and it's held in Moscow because they have a big space program and can provide judges. And we had international judges. It was a good time, and we sang folk songs and gave away money. And we got all their email addresses of every team member, which means we just, over four years now, have quite a number of people who are really into space. Then we held an experimental one with China. And the Chinese Society of Astronautics is our partner and 148 teams registered for the contest. We had to have multiple elimination rounds. We finally got down to the top 10, and it was <laughs> held in Beijing. We've now done this for about six years, and I think we've identified virtually every leader that's going to be in Asia in aerospace, and we have their emails. More importantly, all of them have each other's emails and they all are encouraged to communicate with each other, share problems, share solutions, and do things together. I think that's going to pay off long term. And the total investment of this in this is less than one high mind prize. And it's affected literally thousands of people. Now, we also support business competitions. We support the competition here. We support the competition at Rice University. And, and we'll support anything that's got a high enough multiplier. So don't be shy. Come and see us. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Elon Musk told me that the moon is a harsh mistress was definitive for him as a young man. I can tell you that Peter Diamandis told me that the moon is a harsh mistress by Heinlein is essentially his business plan. And he's not shy about it either. And uh, I think everybody in this room, you know, there's only about two or three hundred people here at this conference. doesn't matter. It just took two or three people to start Apple. Microsoft was started in a guy's kitchen because he didn't have an office. Google got their first check for $100,000 on the front porch of a house, and they didn't cash it for a month because, one, they hadn't incorporated a company, and two, they didn't have a bank account. So what's going to happen in the future is going to be a combination of old tech. By the way, I think that ATK is going to build the equipment that takes us into space because they build solid fuel rocket motors and we're going to use solid fuel rocket motors. I think it's very likely that ATK will be a, a large part of asteroid mining, for example. I invite you to come to our booth. Uh, we, we have a booth set up in here with a real space suit. For our Have Space Suit Will Travel program, which takes spacesuits all over the world to show to kids. I sent a space capsule and two spacesuits, including a Peggy uh, Winston's spacesuit, the head of the astronaut office at NASA, 
Peggy uh, is a lady, as you can tell from the name Peggy, and we displayed it in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. And they bust, uh, part of our contract was they had to bus in girls from the girls' schools as well as boys from the boys' schools. But they did it on different days. And the girls asked the best questions, by the way. I sent my son down there for a, a month. He, it's the longest time he's been without alcohol since he's been 18. <laughs> uh, but a while back, somebody said, well, how can you do all of this if you don't own the moon? You know, if you don't own, if you don't have money, if you can't own the moon. And, and so I bought a piece of the moon. This is a piece of the moon. It, you can see it. I'll have it in the display thing. A, a, and in Beijing, somebody asked me, gee, you act like you can own a piece of the moon. I pulled this out of my pocket and says, I've got mine. Don't you Chinese guys have yours? And, and they admitted that they're going to go get theirs. And, and so just to be difficult, I went out the other day and I bought, let me find it in my pocket. Yeah, here it is, this is the wrong pocket. And I bought a piece of Mars. This is a piece of Mars. And you can see it. So if anybody asks you a question, can you own a piece of Mars? Can you own a piece of the moon? You've got at least one lawyer in Houston, Texas that says the answer is unambiguously yes. And if we do not have a way to make a profit from space, we will not go there. We will not keep spending the wealth of the United States going into space unless we make a profit at it. So NASA is transitioning from being the civil space program of the United States to being the enabler of the commercial space program in the United States, and that is an utterly necessary transition and we would give a prize for it, maybe. <laughs> uh, at any rate, I, I congratulate you for coming here. Every one of you can start a company. When I teach space law at the University of Houston, my first day I come in and I say, okay, first thing you gotta do, go home tonight, start a company. It costs $300, you can do it online, just do it. Don't argue with me. If you don't have 300 bucks, I'll loan it to you. I won't loan it to you, there's too many people in the room. I teach a small seminar. Uh, but you. You'll be amazed what you can do if you have a corporation because it'll force you to think outside the normal box of get a job, work, buy a car, live in an apartment, and so on. So think about that. And think of the fact that you've got more money right now than Steve Jobs had when he started Apple, more than uh, Bill Gates had when he started Microsoft, and the list could continue. And uh, if you do this, maybe someday you'll win the Heinlein Prize. Do you want me to say that? Oh, yes, yes, the promise of the new prize. Okay, how many people here really like to know something? Is there any media in this room? Raise your hand even if you're a blogger. Okay, you're about to get a scoop. Uh, uh, Heinlein's birthday is the 7th of July. And on Heinlein's birthday, the trustees, the three trustees met, and they said, well, this, this, we can't find anybody to give the Heinlein prize to. We want to. And so we created a new prize. It's up to $10,000, but still, that's a good prize for aerospace. And it's the Heinlein Technology Award. The Heinlein Technology Award. We're gonna give it this September. We're gonna announce who won it this September. And it is for technology that has been tested in space that was unexpected that has significant capability to assist commercial activities in space. And of course, these are all fudgy words that the trustees can use to give the prize to anybody they want to. But the fact is, we've got a couple of people already under consideration. Now, the way we select the prize winner is we have three advisors, one for the Americas, one for Asia, and one for uh, Europe. And they recommend, but in this case, for the first year, like we did for the first year of the Heinlein Prize, we're gonna take suggestions from anybody. So if you know anybody that has tested a technology in space, it's gotta be new, it's gotta be unexpected, and it's gotta have the capability of significantly enabling commercial missions or commercial activities. So, okay? Okay. That's it. And you blog about that, and tomorrow it'll be in Space News. Okay.
Great go job, guys. Okay, so let's let's do a, a, a couple of questions here. So so the one thing that's always intrigued me about prizes is th is this whole idea of uh, you don't know who's going to step forward. You don't know what in what dark you know corner or what you know warped deranged brilliant person there um, is is going to win. So. Um, so there's also a good side to that, and there's probably a, a scary side to that a, a, as well. So how do, you, how do you structure your prizes so that you get the maximum amount of um, you know, creativity and yet be specific enough that you, um, that you get something that's useful? So I guess that would be my question to all of you guys that do, do the prizes, and then we'll come back and talk to Sean about how do you go after a prize. I'll start just because I have the mic. So we very consciously go after the broadest pool of solvers that we can. Uh, we, we make sure all of our prizes are global. We spend a, a significant amount of money recruiting teams from around the world. One problem you have when you do that is that you can end up with too many teams and a bunch of just kind of like seriously kind of crazy people who just come up with a, a strange idea. So then there's a, this balance between opening the gates and then setting bars. And we set progressively more and more difficult bars for people to cross. Um, the first one just being a registration fee. We don't put in a fee to make money. We put in a fee to keep people out. Uh, you have to be serious enough to pony up $1,000, $10,000, $25,000, whatever it is, based on the, the level of the prize. We use that to gauge your seriousness because we spend a lot of time and energy nurturing the teams, putting together the playing field, what have, what have you, and we can't have a thousand competitors show up one day. We need it to be 25. So this is one way we, we whittle it down. Um, actually, I'll just stop there and, and, and see what, what your take on. So it also depends on the complexity of the problem that you're looking at or the type of solution you're trying to get through a prize or crowdsourcing activity. For the types of things that I described that we did for the International Space Station Longeron Challenge and the Kevlar and Vectran um, Webbing Strain Measurement Challenge, they should both have acronyms, um, those ones were much more focused on, we knew that there were specific types of skill sets that would be able to sh uh, provide insights on those. For ISS, it was coders, modelers, math people. Uh, for uh, the uh, strain measurement one, it was material scientists, maybe some others as well, but a lot of folks that are lab technicians, material science type folks. And there are existing communities, online communities that already exist that have pools of those people. And so that's, sometimes we choose to work with these uh, innovation intermediaries, we call them, like Innocentive, Topcoder, Kaggle, uh, Tongle, dozens of these communities exist that specialize in specific types of skills. Uh, GrabCAD is one that's like all CAD modelers. Um, so if there's a specific skill set that you want that's almost like excess capacity from your current, what you've got inside organization, that's a way to tap into it depending on how specific the problem is that you're trying to solve. For those things that we do that are bigger technology development and demonstration prizes, um, for those, a, l a large part of the prize definition process is actually that dance between um, understanding the problem that you need solved, understanding who's likely to step up to solve it, and working with those people that are likely to step up to solve it to understand their incentive structure. Uh, Ken Davidian said something years ago about the four Gs for why people participate in prize competitions. Gold, guts, good, and glory. So for some types of things that you do, gold is only part of it. And you structure a prize competition so that the folks that you want to come to play are getting the incentives that work to motivate them. And so there's this kind of you know, dance between the problem that you need solved and the people that you want to try to incentivize to come and finding what that Goldilocks level of specificity is in order, you might not get all the way towards the 10x improvement that you want, but what's realistic is the 5x improvement because you know teams will come for that one. And so um, there's, a bit of it's, there's a bit of interrelatedness between the question of how do you reach the types of solvers that you want that you think you need to solve a specific type of problem without over constraining that problem to a specific field or type of solver. And uh, a lot of it is that prize design is an art and not a science. 
And so um, it's a dance at the beginning, and then oftentimes there, are, there can be rule revisions throughout if you find that you didn't get it right the first time. Just to, to piggyback on that, engaging with the community is such a big part of it. It's not just sitting in your tower and coming up with a prize. It's reaching out to the potential solvers. Bruce, you, you mentioned these people come from corners you can't identify. Okay, that's a given, but you can identify a whole bunch of other corners. So go talk to those people. What would incent them? What's four steps down the line for them that you can kind of get them to move to that place? And then those other folks will, will take care of themselves. They'll come out of left field. But you have to start by working with the potential solvers to get what's realistic for them, and yet still they wouldn't do it without the nudge of the prize. So Sean, let, let me ask you a, a question from the other side of this, and that's, um, what advice would you have for people that are, are considering you know, going after a prize? What, what kind of thought process do you go through or do you think about? Because obviously one of the things that, you know, having been around this for, for a number of years, you, you can't make a business out of winning a prize, no. especially when it costs you more to win the prize than you're going to win. So, so how do you, what, what's your thought process and what advice would you have for people that are considering this? So, again, I was not part of the decision to pursue. The, I was part of the decision on, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> uh, so, a, a couple things. One, uh, prizes are a little, they, they, they are different from some other sources of dollars in that it really does end. We didn't win a second Lunar Lander Challenge, right? There was one, we got it. The check's still on the wall, come by and see it. Um, but there wasn't a second one, which is very different from a lot of funding sources that are out there. There's always another invest, well, hopefully there's always another investor. There's always another contract, there's always another flight or another activity, but the prizes are finite. Um, the other thing about the prize, before I talk about how we spun out of it, is the prize encourages people that have the right amount of crazy. To this day, there are people that show up at our shop and take a look at Zombie and will list for us all the reasons why she can't fly. <laughs> but that's because they're in a, a certain framework and they haven't had that V8 moment yet of going out and, oh, okay, right, there's a whole different approach. And so that's what these prizes do, and that enabled Dave and the team that he had at the time to take a problem and come up with a very different solution. Um, how many of you have heard about the trash can TRL level? A couple folks? Do you so our solution, the company's solution, and I can't, again, I can't claim this as mine, uh, while competing for this prize, we had a problem. Our tank was leaking. And in completion of the first phase, the vehicle landed successfully and then burned up on the pad, which is kind of bad for competing for a prize where you have to fly twice. Uh, so a traditional approach would say, okay, well, you're done. You've, your thing burned up. Go do something else. Instead, they rebuilt it overnight. And since you can't really fabricate a new tank overnight, the best thing that they could do was solve the problem of the tank was leaking. They took a garbage can lid, flipped it upside down, and ran a catheter down the leg. So if you look at the pictures, there's this little drop of, uh, of IPA that is coming out of, off the leg because we had this problem, we had to just solve it. And that trash can lid, the next day, flew on the award-winning flight. I doubt that would pass flight readiness review <laughs> from anyone else. And, and we, so that, that's the sort of stuff that, and I love, I told you I was gonna tell these stories, and I love them, and I wasn't even part of them. Uh, since then, it really has been about taking that accomplishment with, that comes from the right amount of crazy and creating more value from it. And this is the part that I absolutely hate, because I, used to be, I have that MBA, I was the hyper-rationalist business guy. And so I said, okay, well, any business that you're gonna start a business, you have to be hyper-rational. You have to show that there's a market, don't give me 1% of China, you've gotta give me all, like, it has to be real. 
And then I met Dave, who's, you know, he was beyond that. He, there was a right amount of crazy. He said, no, no, this can be done. And you think, well, the odds and all the rest of it. But then once it exists, then you can find a way to create value with it. So the fact that we have a free flying test bed was a benefit that I don't believe was intended when the prize was designed. It wasn't like, oh, great. The next, the time that JPL wants to go to Mars for the second time, they'll have created this platform that will allow them to test out new technologies. And I'm sh I, I doubt that you guys were thinking about, well, you know, when we have a, a, a competition to actually go to the moon, teams that are competing for that X prize, that next X prize, can use this technology and they can test out their stuff in a real world environment. I doubt that was something that was intended. It's the unintended consequences um, that, that comes from these prizes that are encouraged to have just the right amount of crazy. I don't know if that answered your question at all. That's good. <laughs> and then Art, I got a question for you. Um, one of my favorite books um, of, of Heinlein is, I think it was Tomorrow the Stars, about the two brothers, telepathic brothers, one of them goes on the starship. The, the initial premise of that was that their expedition was founded, uh, funded by this foundation that kept um, putting money into research that they thought would never pay off. And it started making so much money that they had to keep coming up with deeper and darker holes to dump the money down because they kept making embarrassing amounts of, of, of money. So I was wondering, you know, one, is, is, is that part of your scheme here with <laughs> your, uh, your approach to try to, to come up with that machine and use that to, to take us to the stars, as Dr. Warden said today? It really is bad when they read your secrets in novels. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Look, the NASA and the X Prize have to choose prizes that have things that can be won, that have identifiable things that have to be done to take and get the prize. In other words, I will do this, and if I do this, I get the prize. I don't have that problem. I'm a patent attorney. My, my training is in intellectual property law. I'm a patent attorney, and I know that every significant paradigm-shifting invention is not believed it's known to be crazy. The people are lunatics. And furthermore, if it worked, it would terribly, terribly threaten entrenched interests. And so the Heinlein Prize has the word accomplishments. Doesn't say, we haven't defined what the word accomplishment means. The word accomplishment might mean convincing the International Monetary Fund to fund a starship for the entire planet Earth as a good thing to do. It might be an accomplishment, you know? But it would have to be some individual's accomplishment, like the Nobel Prize. The Long Range Foundation, which is what you're talking mm -hmm. about in Time for the Stars, made money and had to dump it down rat holes and eventually took and, and sent out starships. Well, I can tell you that the Heinlein Prize Trust has more money in it now than when we started, despite the fact that we've been giving it away. How about that? That's very unusual. In, in, uh, how many people here make a return of 15% a year on their equity? Oh, gee, I can keep my hand up. And it's because we take certain calculated risks. But we have done it consistently now for 10 years, so it isn't a fluke. Yes, that is our eventual intention. And we can fund the Heinlein Prize every single year. We've got enough money to do it. Let me tell you a funny story. When we gave Peter Diamandis the Heinlein Prize, I got him on the phone and told him about it. He, of course, was thrilled because it was a source of money. He was unbelievably thrilled. And furthermore, it was money for him personally, not for the X Prize or anything else. It's just for him, you know. I did make him get his wife on the telephone so they'd both be together when I told him. So that was a good thing to do. Now, we held a, a big party in Houston to give, give him the check, as you can imagine, because holding a party is half of the fun. I mean, most of life is figuring out ways to hold good parties. Think of it that way. <laughs> now, 
You know, we had a spacesuit sitting in a chair. We had, a, we had the Heinlein rocket carved into an ice sculpture. We'd invited 24 astronauts, every one of whom showed up. And I went out and I hired two actors. And one of them played Lazarus Long and the other one played uh, Dee Dee Harriman. And I told them to stay in character no matter what. And so Dee Dee Harriman went around all day, all night, during the party, bugging people to invest in his rocket to the moon. And, and Lazarus Long, who's another character from high, wore a kilt and showed up with this sword that we gave away. And people asked me about the sword. I said, I don't know, this guy over here, you know, in the kilt showed up. I don't know who the hell he is. He gave us, he says he's, you know, go talk to him. And, and of course, now, the people who read Heinlein would recognize who these characters are. So I said if they were really pressed by somebody that really knew Heinlein, they were to hand the backup business card, which was for the actor in Double Star, in the, in the rather more obscure Heinlein book, Double Star. But that isn't the funny thing. The funny thing is that I got to, I forgot to write the check and, at, for the prize. And it was a half a million dollars. That first one was a half a million. So I got out the checkbook and I wrote the check very fast and I signed it, I tore out the check and I ceremoniously handed it to, to, to Peter. And then a week later I got a call from California. He'd noticed that I'd accidentally dated it a year in advance. <laughs> in other words, I it dated the check for the next year. And I said, oh, it's just a mistake, Peter. Uh, you know, take and tear it up, I'll send you a different check. And then Peter showed his true genius. He said, Art, if you do that, could I hold this one for a year and then cash it? <laughs> so looking for money is something that all entrepreneurs have to do. Uh, now we have one other, can I take one more second? Sure. Remember I had 24 astronauts. And so I had, we had the sword. And it's a big old real sword, it's cool. And it has Dom Viemus Viemus written on it, which means while we live, let us live. It's a cool, cool sword. I, had the, I said, well, everybody who's flown in space line up in the front of the room, and I had them pass the sword hand to hand, and finally ending up at Peter. Now, so far, this sounds pretty normal. But of course, my two actors, one of them was Lazarus Long. And Lazarus Long, he's, you know, he's 4,000 years old. He's been in space for 2,000. He stayed in character. He went right to the front of the room, and he stood right next to Peter in his kilt. So this sword is passed from identifiable astronaut to identifiable astronaut. And finally, it gets to this funny guy in a kilt. And you know he's got to be a space traveler, because that's what we called for. And he hands it to Peter. And we videoed that, and we digitized the video, and it's in archives all over the world. And a thousand years from now, when everybody's forgotten everything except what the names of the astronauts are, they're going to try to identify the astronauts as they go down that line. And they're going to get to Lazarus Long and say, who is this guy? It is a wonderful Easter egg joke. <laughs> so let's... I'm, I'm having fun. No, this is great. <laughs> so let's open it up for some questions from the audience. We got about nine minutes left. So, anybody got any questions for the panel? You, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that uh, prizes need certain kinds of qualities to work, but I don't actually remember you listing what they might be. I was wondering if you could comment. So, the characteristic of the problem, or the way in which you execute the prize, both. <laughs> All right. So the nature that so the first one is more complicated. So I'll start there. Um, we actually at NASA are funding some research on the topic of what types of problems are best suited to decomposition to approach through this kind of uh, novice uh, contribution um, through through prizes because it's largely unknown from a systematic level what types of problems are best suited to uh, prizetization. So we're trying to think about it from a systems engineering perspective. Like if you have a large program that you're trying to implement, and you have some problems within that program, which of, how do you maximize the contributions from the experts and then the contributions from the crowd or novices or potential outliers to ultimately result in the best possible outcome for that program? 
And so we're studying some research, uh, some research we're um, funding research at Harvard, at GW, a few other places that people are looking at our data set of now over 100 challenges that have been run, types of challenges that have been run out of NASA to try to identify what types of problems are best suited for this type of tool. Because we're trying to try to use it strategically within the agency alongside contracts, grants, and the other. We need to understand more systematically where they work best. And so that's still an open question, but it's a question that we're actively addressing and we're funding academics to look at it so that we're not just doing it within our own ac uh, you know, echo chamber, that we're um, getting some, some uh, good, hard academic look on the, on the topic. On the second piece, uh, characteristics for how prizes themselves um, run well, um, or characteristics of prizes themselves as they're run, I'd say the other thing that's really the important work that we're, that we're doing is trying to articulate the different outcomes that prizes can result in. Um, it, this is especially um, uh, common with leaders at any organization. So it's not just leaders at NASA, but leaders at any, um, uh, at any company that might say to their staff, go and design a prize or prize this problem. They, in their own mind, would have a particular outcome that they'd like to see from it. And those outcomes need to be exp uh, express expressively uh, identified at the beginning. So you're giving not just the leader, but the problem, the result that they deserve. And so what I mean by that is some people think prizes are just public outreach and education. Some people think prizes, like if you can't use that solution in your, like your operational space at the end of the day, then why'd you even run it? But we run into issues there when we're running a type of prize where we don't own the IP because we're trying to stimulate commercial development and the teams need to own the IP. And so, of course, we're not going to pick it up and use it right at the end of the challenge because we don't own it. And we didn't, the, the point wasn't to own it, the point was to stimulate a commercial marketplace. But that has to be understood by folks at the beginning that that was the purpose. <laughs> it wasn't to use it at the back end. And so trying to force people to articulate at the very beginning what outcome it is that, you can have more than one or two that you're trying to, to drive for, but prize design can look very different depending on the outcome that you're trying to drive towards, whether it's being able to pick up and use the solution day after, stimulating commercial marketplace, demonstrating a proof of concept, advancing research, advancing TRL, like there's a number of different types of outcomes that you can demonstrate through a prize competition, but um, a characteristic upfront is that you have to define your outcomes from the very beginning, otherwise you're just gonna be telling stories at the end based on whatever you can glean together to try to justify the investment, but it wasn't necessarily intentional at the beginning unless you do that activity. Hope that addressed the question. Good job. Joel, you have anything to add to that? Since our outcomes are really the same, we're, no matter what the prize, we're trying to stimulate a commercial market. So we're, we're clear on that at XPRIZE. One of the ways we do that is we at XPRIZE, XPRIZE employees never judge a competition. So we empower outside judges to define the rules, to define who's in, who's out, and who wins. And this not only keeps us clean, so we have really no interest in, we take no IP, we have no interest in who wins, but it also engages the leaders in that field in following these teams to the micro level, right? So now they are deeply engaged with these teams and have been for years as they follow them submission after submission and, and look at their progress. And then once the prize is finished, then hopefully the relationship continues. And we're starting to get pretty good at this where we set the teams up for success a little better than, than we were historically, uh, to have contracts available to them as soon as, they, as soon as they demonstrate their ability to do something. That's one of the things that we think is very powerful in, in our model. So we've got time for one more quick question if you hurry. Yes. So I have a question about sort of the limits uh, of prizes. Is there a, a point in terms of the size of the prize at which it stops making sense? you may need to go to a payment for milestone sort of approach to incentivizing. Uh, I'm just thinking about sort of uh, the Google Lunar X Prize and some of the changes that have occurred recently in adding what, what looks like some milestone steps. Thanks. That's a question that we wrestle with quite a bit. Uh, we'll sit there in, in what we call visioneering, where we just kind of blue sky prizes. And often people come in, a $100 million prize for the person who can cure cancer. Okay, well that's, that's great, but is it, is it achievable? 
And even if it is, let's say, okay, maybe there's an unidentified cure for cancer that we can find with a prize. Is $100 million a number that even makes sense? Because there's an actual market there that's worth $100 billion. So the $100 million prize is, doesn't incent somebody to do something that they wouldn't already be doing. So you kind of want to back it up, and we, we use a, an analogy of dominoes. And if we want to get to some place at the end, that last domino, what is the first one we can knock down? What's the first, cheapest, quickest one we can knock down to set this thing in motion? Uh, it was a lesson that we did learn from GLXP, and we may have designed that prize differently now, if we were to do it now. But the milestone prizes that we put in place have helped us to get back to that kind of motif and that, that mentality. And I think there is this thing where you don't want to make it so big that it's a 20-year endeavor and someone wins this gigantic purse because that's kind of what we're all doing anyway. Yeah, um, really good question. And there's a lot of learning that goes on in the prize community as every prize is run. <laughs> so, so it's a very iterative process. And a good example of that is um, one of the challenges, one of the new potential um, centennial challenges that NASA um, is considering um, announcing soon is our first in-space prize competition. Uh, uh, Google Lunar X Prize is obviously an in-space prize competition, but um, we have released two RFIs seeking comments on our first uh, deep space CubeSat challenge. So um, it's got two elements. One is a deep space communications challenge. And the other is a basically a race to get around, um, a race to get in lunar orbit. Um, with a six U form factor CubeSat. So um, we spent a lot of time designing that prize, $5.5 .5 million total prize purse uh, up for that one, and learning from things like Google Lunar X Prize. Part of the concept as it's currently framed, which you can see in the RFI that was just released, it just closed um, July 31st, or no, July, what's today? July, no, it wouldn't have been July 31st, June 30th maybe? Just recently closed, but if you still have comments, you can still feel free to send them in. Um, but there's ground qualification reviews for that challenge. It's the first time that we've done that degree of ground qualification segments where we're trying to, um, in this, this prize concept, there would be potentially each of the top five placing teams in the ground segments could be awarded $100,000 during the ground testing process of it in order to A, uh, uh, show that they are one of the top five competitors to help them with raising capital. So that they can say, hey, we won this phase one prize on the ground. It's only 20K, but hey, investor, look, really, we were one of the top teams. NASA called us one of the top teams in this challenge. It might help them to raise money for it. Um, and the total amount that they could potentially, we heard this from universities and academics, too, that that was really important for getting those teams involved in that particular challenge, was to be able to like, pay their grad students. Um, so getting universities involved versus getting commercial sector involved are also very different how you structure a prize. So this particular challenge, um, keep an eye out on this challenge if anyone's going to CubeSat, uh, the CubeSat conference next week. Um, Sam Ortega and the Centennial Challenge guys will be talking a lot more about this particular challenge there next week. It's a really exciting one um, that NASA is considering. So if you have any additional comments on that, please let us know. But we learn, we learn from that same question that you had, and their lessons from now announcing milestone prizes with the Google Lunar X Prize, that these small upfront challenges can be, or prizes can be important indicators that the teams then need in order to take to investors to keep themselves going and validate their claims and legitimize uh, their work that could be multiple years. I mean, we're not talking about flying these things until 2017 with winners announced in 2018. So like, it's four years, it's a long time to sustain yourself. So anyway, we're out of time, so let me, please help me thank my panel. <laughs> Aviation um, to that, to, at that point in time. So the idea here is, is that prizes can be a powerful tool. And so if, if you look at that, um, also in 1924, the other thing I found out was that the first around the world flight occurred by uh, some Army Air Corps um, float planes. And they flew around the world successfully and they survived and they lived. It took them 175 days to fly around the world. 45 years later, after that first 175 day flight, the Boeing 747 first flew, 1969, same year as the Apollo astronauts walked on the moon. 
So the reason that I bring this up is that the past does not have to equal the future, that changes often comes in fits and starts, and I would say that we've been in a fit and maybe we're starting to see a start. Or maybe it's the other way around. I can never get my fits and my starts, you know, straight. But, you know, the, the, the future can be different and sometimes it moves at lightning fast speed. Remember, it was only 20 years ago that people were sitting in rooms like this, because this hotel was here then, and they were saying, have you heard of this thing called the internet? Do you ever think anybody's going to make any money at that? 20 years ago. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with the next panel. Um, working for XPRIZE for over, uh, about a year now, I understand the power of prizes, and so I'm really excited about this panel. So I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, who is the Chief Systems Engineer at NASA Space Portal, Bruce Pittman. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Isn't feedback a wonderful thing? Um, see, I just woke you all up though, didn't I? So anyway, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and I have an outstanding panel. Um, and so what I started to do is I started saying, you know, it's been 45 years since, uh, since Apollo and a, a certain number of things have happened. I said, what did the world look like 45 years before Apollo? You know, so I started, you know, what did I do? I did what everybody does, I went to Google. And I said, you know, history, U.S., 1924. And what came up? Guess who's president of the United States? Your good friend and mine, Calvin Coolidge, you know, is president of the United States. There's this new radical music on, in New York called Rhapsody in Blue by this guy named Gershwin, you know, who wasn't known for this kind of stuff. But, and Gershwin was scared to death that this thing was absolutely going to bomb but it did okay. Montana elected the first woman governor in 1924, and two people you've never probably heard of, a guy named Jimmy Carter and George Herbert Walker Bush, were both born in 1924. So it was kind of an interesting year. And it was also the last year of the original Ortigue Prize. So Ortigue was a rich um, hotelier in uh, New York City, and in 1919, he had established a prize with the Aero Club of America for, for you today. And we're gonna talk about a really interesting topic, and that's prizes. Now, who doesn't like prizes? I mean, remember when you were a kid, for those of you that are old enough to remember this, with, with Cracker Jacks, and you always wanted to know or those stupid cereal things where you were always trying to get to the bottom of the box so you could get the little, the little prize. So, so we all grew up um, liking prizes. So this is kind of like prizes on steroids. So, you know, some really good, some really good stuff. So um, let me have some opening remarks and to kind of set the stage here and uh, put a little historical perspective on this. And I'm going to turn it over and introduce the, the panelists, and then they'll each make some introductory remarks. Then we'll do some... Uh, discussions here and then we'll open it up to, to uh, discussions and questions from the, uh, from the audience. So as was mentioned, this is the 45th anniversary of Apollo 11. As a matter of fact, 45 years ago today, Apollo 11 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and the mission was over and you got them to see them in the little, uh, their, their little isolation suits and then they went in the little trailer, the isolation trailer, because we were afraid that they were gonna have moon bugs and, and that whole thing. And we did a science conference this, this, um, 
this week at Ames, and I was chairing uh, a, a focus group on lunar commerce for a $25,000 prize for the first uh, entity, you know, non-governmental entity, to fly from either New York to Paris or Paris to New York, whichever way you wanted to go. And if you did that successfully, you would get $25,000. So he established that in 1919, and it timed out in 1924, because it was only good for five years. And guess what? Nobody won. So rule number one about prizes. One is you don't have to pay unless somebody wins. And two, that if you don't set it right, or if you are too aggressive, or, or the conditions aren't right, sometimes nobody goes after it. Ortig does not give up, though. He redid the prize for another uh, period of time. So again, this is 1924. Um, and he did something in else on the second go round. He actually put the money in the bank in a trust fund. So it's like, you know, are you, do you really got the money? You know, so he actually put the money in the bank and there was a, there was a panel, you know, that w of judges there and all that. And so that started, uh, so now aviation had progressed to the point where there was a lot of, a lack, a lot of activity about it. And this, you know, guy that nobody had ever heard of before, a guy named Charles Lindbergh, you know, nobody was betting on Lindbergh. And he went and he won this thing and became an overnight sensation. I mean, he was the rock star of, of 